I just want to talk about power over Ethernet, the basics of it, the, the applications of power over Ethernet for access control, the standards, the sketch up to speed. Some of this might be a refresher course. Others might you know, learn a few new things, but feel free to ask questions during it. I'll be available afterwards as well for information, okay? But yeah, basically, what is PoE? How it works with access, uh, access control? And going into the future, what uh, is the, you know, the future for PoE in our industry? Okay, so first off, anyone uh, have any ideas what PoE means? Pretty simple, right? Power over Ethernet. You got the, the data and the power over the same Cat 5 or 6 cable. Okay, nothing too special about that. It actually started off as a nice application for wireless routers and access points and VOIP phones. And in the last four or five years, we've said, hey, this is great for access control too. We can really lower our installation costs. Let's uh, give it a try. Okay? And we did. There's basically two parts to PoE. Okay? And if you're a Red Sox fan or a Cubs fan, we'll do some baseball analogy here. Uh, you have a pitcher and a catcher. Right? The pitcher in, in our world is called the power sourcing equipment, or PSE. This device provides the power, and it usually provides it at about 48 watt uh, volts, uh, maybe up to 50, 55 volts on the, on the Ethernet cables. Okay? And it uses intelligent discovery to find out who is at the other end of the cable. Because you can't supply power to every device, but you can't accept the power. Right? So there's some negotiation going on to see before I provide the full power, I gotta know that you can accept it. Okay? So that accepting device is also called the, the power device, the PD. That's the catcher. This device takes the power, extracts it, steps it down maybe from 48 volts to 12 or 24, what we need for access control applications, and consumes the power. Okay, a little diagram here, you see a controller at each door, which is the power device and there's a power sourcing equipment on the network. Okay, questions, comments so far? Okay. Well, as far as power sourcing equipment, there's actually a fork in the road here. You can go down the end span road or the mid span road, okay? And there's differences here. The end span is basically a device that has a switch and the power functions in one device. A PoE enabled switch, per se. You know, most of the, the major manufacturers have these types of switches. Okay, Cisco, Netgear, HP. And for new jobs, it's great. One device does it all. Okay. For retrofits, though, you might have existing switches or network gear. In that case, you can provide a mid-span in between the switch and the power devices to inject the power, and you can get these in you know, one port, four port, 12 port, 24 port devices, and they provide really nice, reliable power. So for retrofits, you'd use the mid spans. For new projects, end spans are probably a little more efficient for you to use, okay? They both do a great job. Actually, mid spans do a little better job at raw power. If you have a 24 port device and you want actually 30 watts of power per port, that device will do it. It'll provide the 700 watts of power all at once. End spans, you might have to look at the fine print there because they might say they can do 30 watts of power on each port, but not all at the same time. Okay, because the total power rating for that device might just be 250 watts. So you do some calculation and say, oh, well, hmm, I better uh, not use all the power at the same time here or else I'll be in trouble. So just, just watch out on the different ratings of these different devices. Okay, as far as the standards, they're governed by IEEE. And if you go back in time, set the Wayback Machine to 2003, the first PoE standard came out, and this dictated a minimum wattage of about 13 watts at that power device. It starts out life at around 15 watts, but if you go 100 meters and you have some line losses, we still can guarantee you 13 watts at that end device. Okay, a lot of times you get more. Okay, you don't go 100 meters all the time at each uh, network segment. Okay, that's 802.3 AF. Okay, six years later, 
Pee-wee Plus came out. You know, the need for power grew and the committees got together and they said, hey, we can double the power here. So now we have 34 watts at the uh, power sourcing equipment. And again, we have the line losses to deal with, okay? But worst case, you're still at 25.5 watts of power at the device, okay? And these things are backward compatible. So if you have a, a PoE Plus uh, switch and a PoE device, don't worry about it. You're not, not going to blow up anything. They will be compatible. They will only ask for the power that they can consume. Okay. And both these standards use two of the four Ethernet pairs. If you look at a Cat5 cable, there's four different pairs of wires, four twisted pairs. So we have two pairs doing the power. And in some cases, they're separate pairs. Other cases are the same pair. It doesn't matter, the standard kind of accommodates both and will negotiate the proper uh, power to the device. Okay. So we got our standard straight. Now let's see how they apply to access control. And the main premise here is to power the whole door with the one Cat5. You don't want to have the Cat5 do the power for the controller, put a separate lock power supply wired up with two wires to the mortise lock. That's just not very efficient, right? So the whole point here is to power the complete door with one Cat5 cable. And I have three different types of applications here I want to talk about. Okay, one is a traditional controller at the door. Okay, second is an IP reader. And the third is an, an IP lock set, integrated lock set that we're seeing a lot more of these days. Let's start off with our controllers. I promise it won't be a sales pitch, although we do make a nice uh, iStar that happens to have PoE, but I'm not going to tell you anything more about it. <laughs> but this controller mounts above the door, and again, you have the whole uh, set of devices wired back to the controller and powered from that Cat5 cable. The reader, the locking device, whether it be a mortise lock, a mag lock, a strike, um, they're all wired back to the controller. Uh, the door switch, the PIR for the exit, uh, the exit device. And the beauty here is that the controller gives you a lot of flexibility. It has multiple inputs and outputs. You can add that third or fourth input. You can add a second output for the sounder above the door. It gives you, in some cases, some brands have a selection for 12 or 24 volt lock power um, on, the, on the PoE side. So you have a little flexibility in your lock selection as well. And I kind of figure the controller is the best for the critical security applications. The controller is in the secure side of the, of the area. Um, you can do a lot of custom logic in the controller to do man traps and two-man rule and you know, a lot of um, input-output linking between controllers. Okay, it gives you the, the most flexibility in access control. Okay. Oh, and PoE Plus, I mentioned that. In some cases, you'll need that 30 watts of power to control certain uh, door lock devices. You know, the 15 watts won't cut it. Um, 30 watts gives you that much more flexibility okay, for access control applications. <laughs> Okay, a second choice here is an IP reader. Uh, there are various makes and models. Um, we do integrate with a few from HID. Um, our sister company has some. Um, here's pictured one from CEM. This is the concept of one single device being the reader and the controller. The I.O. wiring is usually in the back of the device, so it does make it a little bit less secure. Okay, but you make up for that in certain cases with the flexibility, with the install savings. It's one device. Pop it there, wire it up, and you're done. Okay, I kind of figure this is more for the less secure areas, you know, in the scheme of things, okay? Um, but it's very simple to install, and you do get the extra, extra cost savings in that regard. Okay. Interior less secure areas for the IP readers. The third one here is the one that we've really seen a big uptick in, and that's the idea of integrated lock sets, where you have you know, the lock containing the read head, containing the PIR, containing the request to exit device, and one you know, very easy to mount device. They do have some wireless models as well, but in the PoE world, the only thing is you gotta get the wires to the, to the lock set. That means usually going through the door. So just watch out because you gotta get the you know, the door cord or have a cord for you before you install it. 
and then use a, a special PoE hinge to extend the wires back up to the network. Okay. Those hinges work great though. They had a few problems when they first came out, but now they're, they're very reliable to get the, the wires back through to the network. Okay. These are great, again, for install savings. It's one device to mount. Simple install. Um, you can remount these on different doors easily if your needs change. Okay. I kind of think these are, these are great, again, for interior areas. Um, minimal traffic. You don't want to have these um, you know, going like a fast lane here. You want to probably do it for, uh, for less intrusive areas. Okay. Now, this one is sort of a hybrid. This one is a Wiegand lock set with a PoE door controller. So it's kind of a marriage here of the controller with more of a dumb lock set. There's no database in it. It's, it's a device that kind of mimics the traditional I.O. of a door. So the lock set has a Wiegand reader. It has the door switch. It has the PIR in it. But the wiring comes out, not direct Ethernet there, but your traditional 12 wires. You know, six for the Wigan read head, two for the lock, two for the door switch, and two for the PIR. And you wire it up to the, to the controller. So in this case, there's no compatibility issues. You can use these on old systems, new systems. You're not worried about software drivers or whatnot. The controller, you know, does the work. It does the door decision. And the lock set is just long for the ride. So we've seen a lot of uptick in, in these types of locks. Okay, just gives people nice, nice options to add, you know, easy locks uh, to existing buildings. Okay, so whichever you know route you choose, the controllers, the lock sets, the benefits are pretty much the same. You save cost. Okay, um, our integrators have have told me that they're seeing a good twenty percent savings in the overall installation cost of, of a project due to the, uh, the, the power supplies not being provided. Those are in the IT world now. Less wiring, uh, less install time, okay? And the second benefit though is, you know, it's a, it's a nice side benefit, and that is improved network reliability. Because we get feedback now on the power use of those devices. We can get some proactive messages sent back up if there's a problem. If the, the lock is starting to short out or you know, the, the powers just seem to rise on a certain segment, you know, that switch will tell us what's going on. Okay, so your network reliability just overall is raised because of, of PoE. And this is especially important as you move out into an enterprise network where you have servers in different states, the system is you know, widespread, would it be great to manage your power from one central place and have access to, you know, the specific current draw of every controller in your network? Okay. So yeah, it really does, you know, help overall your network reliability. Also, one of the integrators was telling me that as a side benefit here, it's just great to install temporary deployments. You know, if you have an enterprise, you have a new office starting up, a new uh, area of your building, you know, add in some you know, 10 readers on PoE, boom, 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 they're in. You know, versus planning out a full, you know, install with, with conduit and, um, you know, more labor costs. Okay, this is the last slide, I think. Um, looking forward, so we have PoE at, what, 15 watts? PoE plus, who's not paying attention, how many? 30, 34 watts, right? So let's see if we can double it again. Um, we have PoE Ultra now in committee. There's been draft standards by IEEE. There's a, a four-pair working group where basically, remember we had the two pairs for the power out of the four, but now we're going to do all four pairs. So you basically go from 30 to 60 watts. In fact, they're even talking 90 watts. I'm not sure if the physics is going to work out with the heat gain of those, you know, four pairs of, uh, of, of power uh, wiring but once the standard's out, you're going to see a lot of uh, uh, mid-span and end-span suppliers getting on the bandwagon. There's a few out now that have pre-release products for PoE Ultra, uh, but they're not standard yet, so you're taking a little risk if you, if you buy those. But with 60 watts, you can really do a lot. I mean, even those you know, one-amp mortise locks are no problem at that point. 
okay? Um, in general, as far as amperage, you know, just be sure you calculate your power budget depending on what lock set you use, what reader, make sure you are, you're under those standards um, in your design. This will be all set. Okay. And finally, on the road ahead, um, we talked about those line losses, right, from you know, 30 to 25. Well, that's a pretty big uh, hit. There's also some study groups going on to redesign the standards so that you have more of an energy efficient PUE, so there's less line losses with better uh, component selection, optimized to reduce the line losses. So, you know, if you reduce that by 50%, that's a few watts times how many doors do you have? You know, that makes a big uh, difference in your power consumption. So yeah, PoE is here to stay. It's, it's great. We use it a lot, um, and like to uh, you know open up for questions or comments. And you know, thank you for your attention.